Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of What's on Your Shelf. Allow me to introduce to you my guest today. This is none other than Franz Owano. I'm a man who has many hats. I'm a medical doctor, I'm an author of many books, and I'm also a publisher, among many other things. I'm a son, a brother, father to be one day. So I've specialized in mental health, a field called psychiatry. I always got into trouble because apparently I used to talk too much. So every time we used to leave church, my mom used to put me aside for punishment. Yeah, I've endured so much heartbreak. So I've been rejected in almost every publishing house mm. known in the city. I got to my 10th book by 30. I think it was on April 10th, 2020. I'll never forget. It was a momentous day for me. History is written by the people who harmed our heroes. And let's start from there. You have uh, nine published books that are out there. Yes. Where did this start? So basically, the uh, foundation of my writing began in my formative years. I had access to a vast library as a young boy, uh, nurtured by my father's influence. So he was very big on reading because I think he believed that was our access to the world. So. You may be in the recesses of Kisumu, but if you read, you can know what's happening the world over. So I grew up in Kisumu. Uh, that's where I was born, schooled briefly before we moved here. So the library was a great source of solace for us mm. as a family. And when I got to medical school, I think out of some frustrations, existential frustration, as I'd like to call, call it, mm. Mm. I started doubling. And uh, with time, I realized that there was something concrete within this. So I decided to take it a bit more seriously. Mm. So I made a bet with myself after, after writing my first play, I think at around 20 years of age in second year, mm. I made a pact that I'd get to 10 books by the time I was 30. And so I did the five-year system of medicine. Currently, they do six years. Mm. So in our time, we didn't have breaks. We didn't have long breaks. So every time you do your end-of-year exam, you have three weeks before you transition to the next year. Mm. So in those three weeks, I maximized. So every break, I wrote a book. Every break, I wrote a book. Every break, I wrote a book. Mm. So by the time I graduated, I think I was on four books. And then from there, during my internship, I wrote one book through the entire period because I didn't have time for obvious reasons. Then after I finished my internship, I got more time. And in that period between 2016 and 2019, before I went back for my master's, mm. I think I wrote like five books in a row, right? Just churning them out, churning them out, churning them out. Yeah, till I got to my, ten, my 10th book by 30. I think it was on April 10th, 2020. I'll never forget. It was a momentous day for me. But then after I got to my 10th book, uh, by then I was still unpublished and all these manuscripts were, fill, were filling my house and there was a sense of desolation in my spirit because uh, none of the hard work had translated into anything mm. and there was a lot of disappointment. So my younger brother had floated the idea of self-publishing. So I tried to get published in the, through the traditional method but I kept getting a lot of frustration and I felt like traditional publishing to be honest and uh, not to be offensive, I feel like they are rooted in the past. Mm. They are more interested in selling textbooks than exploring all genres of literature. So they leave out so many themes and subjects, right? So the, the, the elements of fiction, mm. the elements of sci-fi, the elements that delve into elements of sexuality, right? I feel like they prevent that form of expression, right? Mm. So what about people who do not want, who do not need textbooks, right? We're locking out all those genres of literature and also ideological differences with editors also uh, kept breaking my heart. Mm -hmm. I remember there's one book I wrote. It was my, I think it was the final book I wrote before I graduated. It was called uh, Chasing After Unicorns. So it's a book uh, rooted in mental health based in Madare, where I actually did my, my master's. That's why we had clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways it foreshadowed me joining the field of psychiatry, but I didn't know it back then. Mm. So the editors were very interested in the book, but now push came to shove when they told me I have to change the title of my book. So I tried to explain to them that 
the reason I called the book Chasing After Unicorn is because mental health sometimes can be elusive, mm-hmm. right? And uh, what is the description of normal? True? So normal is a spectrum. Mm-hmm. And sometimes chasing normality can be akin to chasing a unicorn, an unfictional animal, right? Mm-hmm. So the elusive nature of mental health and stability was why I used that title. And then he told me, Kenyans don't read. It will be too complex for Kenyans. So I was I was filled with so much disgust because, uh, in a sense, do these editors and traditional publishers have such a low opinion of us as a people that we cannot grasp uh, elements of a metaphor? Yeah. So after that... Yet the person who is writing the title is Kenyan. And yet the person who is writing the title is Kenyan. Okay. So I felt that there's a disconnect between us and our ideological differences will prevent us having a harmonious harmonious uh, working relationship. Mm. And on top of that, to an extent, I feel like traditional publishing can be exploitative, right? So they deny you a lot of say in the creative process, and the editors have almost exclusive power into how your final product will look, right? And uh, for someone who does, doesn't write for money, mm. yeah, I'm writing to create a legacy, right? Because this is how I will leave my mark in the world. This is how I will be remembered. Mm. So it's not just enough enough to get money from this. It's a bonus and it's important, but it's not the core issue, right? It's leaving a legacy. So for you, you might just be doing a job, yeah. but for me, this is how I will be remembered. Mm. This is how my grandchildren will remember me, yeah, generations after I'm gone. So I felt that I need to take creative control of my work. Mm. And that's when I decided to <coughs> take a leap yeah. and uh, start publishing myself. Okay. Yes. Are you rebellious in nature? Ah, uh, I've been accused of many things, <laughs> but I think, I think, rebellion is a matter of perspective, right? Mm. Mm. According to the colonialists, were the Africans who are agitating for independence rebellious? Of course they were. According to, uh, according to, to patriarchy, women and feminists who are fighting for equal rights, are they rebellious? Yes. According to the Catholic Church, are Protestants rebellious? Yes. But it's a matter of perspective. Mm. Am I rebelling for rebellion's sake? Or am I actually agitating to improve something? Yes, or to protest against an unfair system? Mm. Yes. What, what in your upbringing informed who you are today? So, uh, to be honest with you, I come from a lineage of very tough women. And my grandmothers on both sides yeah. were very tough women. And I think it also translated into the children that they had. Uh, my grandfathers were very gentlemen so to speak yeah. mm. uh, and in more ways than one the fam- the anchors of the family were the women mm. and uh, these old women who are now dead and gone may they rest in peace informed a lot of my opinions about the world and also in some strange way introduced me to the world of literature i think apart from my grandmothers it's i'd like to say my parents mm. definitely they had a great role so my dad introduced me to the world of literature and books. Mm. Uh, my mom taught me morality, a uh, sense of right and wrong that I've carried with me all through. Uh, my siblings have also been very instrumental in challenging me. I come from a serious type A family. We are four doctors. Mm. So you can imagine, right? Everyone keeps up in the ante, <laughs> right? So yes. you have to, it's a word for it. Mm, you have to surpass. Yeah, sink or swim. Mm. So on top of that, I know this might be taken the wrong way, but I went to the Alliance High School. Mm. Yes. Okay. Before the criticism begins. <laughs> so yeah. I went to the Alliance High School. Yeah. So the Alliance High School is also quite formative mm. in in shaping the person I am today. Now on top of the Alliance High School, I'd say medical school. Yeah. Because it was a radical shift. So Alliance in many ways taught me a lot about the world. Mm. It taught me about about, uh, about inequality, right? It taught me that intelligence is important, but it might not be enough to make it in this world. Mm. Yeah. And from Alliance now delving into medical school was a transition. Because in Alliance, we, we have a collection of young men from all parts of the country mm. who are extremely intelligent. Yeah, first among equals. And in some ways, my first... My first weeks in the lands, I was a bit humbled because mm. I realized I may not be as smart as I thought I was. <laughs> yes, I'm intelligent, fairly, yeah. but I'm, I, 
confronted geniuses, yeah. genius level intelligence. Yeah, so it's yeah, uh, it makes you uh, bite your bite your tongue a bit and just yeah. calm down a bit. Yeah? yeah, but in a sense also it helps you get a sense of self acceptance, right? Because now if you start making comparisons, yeah, right, uh, it might lead to neurosis. True. So you accept yourself the way you are, and know what works for you mm. in a system of people who are hyper intelligent. Now I'm moving on to medical school. Now where I also met equally intelligent people, but I think the essence of medical school was to teach me humility, something that I don't think I'd have learned if I had not been there. Did you always want to be a doctor? To be honest with you, this was not the plan. Yeah, I thought I was going to end up in law school. It was always my plan to become a lawyer, uh, but my parents, and I think life in general, had different plans. So there's a saying, life is what happens when you're busy making plans. Mm. So I think when, when in the grand scheme of things, whoever controls the fates, the fates and the designs of how our lives turn out, decided where would I be of more benefit, mm. in medicine or in law. Plus my parents were really keen on me doing medicine and they really encouraged me. So ideally, Ideally, part of me was itching to rebel. Uh, and then my mom had a, a, some a serious conversation with me. Mm. And uh, there's a way she, she frames things in a way that makes me see things in a broader picture mm. uh, to temper with the emotion, right? So eventually I decided, why not follow the, the old people's advice? And I think it worked out okay. for the better. Yes. So you practice today? Yes, I'm practicing. Every single day? Every single day. Where do you get the time to write all these books? Guys, uh, Franz has nine books on my desk. And he says he has manuscripts for more than 18 books. Yes. So, uh, simply put, yeah. If you love something, you make time. Yeah. Really? If you love something, you make time. I, de I debate that. I think because uh, it's all a matter of priorities, to be honest, mm. right? Uh, but but uh, I'll also add something, right? Yeah. You cannot have it all. And it's something I think I've learned the hard way, right? There has to be a sacrifice, mm -hmm. right? So it's either you sacrifice your personal relationships to get this done, because you can't sacrifice work, mm -hmm. definitely. Mm -hmm. You have to make a livelihood. So it's either you sacrifice your personal relationships or you sacrifice your extracurricular activities. But something has to give. Mm -hmm. or you sacrifice your sleep. You cannot have it all. Okay. Mm. So we'll get to the books. Yes. But I want to understand mm. this man, your dad, yes. your father. Mm. Um, what's your perspective of who he is and how he influenced? Because you've mentioned that he had a, a huge library. He still yeah. has. Still has. And he did not entertain video games. No, none at all. And how did that influence who you are today? So... Basically, uh, my dad is a man of his generation, right? So uh, whatever good and bad he's done, I understand that it comes from a generational bias, right? Mm. So for him, he was uh, very interested in us developing a reading culture. And so he, he did not allow us to venture into such things as gaming, right? Mm. But of course, as a young man, the influences of people around you and also the need to fit in, Right? It was something important to me as a young boy. But he stood firm. Right? So every time I asked for, in fact, the first time I think I asked for a video game, he gave me a book called Think Big by Ben Carson. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine an eight year old reading Think Big. Yeah. <laughs> and so since there was no form of, you know, of uh, apart, from, apart from playing with friends outside, maybe, mm -hmm. there was another form of, of stimulation. So the books were the source. So I understand where he was coming from. And in many ways, it was, uh, it was a system of tough love, mm. but he meant well. And I think the product is admirable. Yeah. Yes. From a, an expert perspective, mm. what happens in the brain of a child, especially when it comes, because they, today we're living in the advent of social media, mm. their phones, mm. kids have phones, their TV, TV stations, we have all mm. a variety of things to watch mm. and entertain yourself. Mm. How does that influence the brain of a child? So basically, uh, how I'd put it is this way, and I'll put it in very simple terms that you can follow. Uh, there's a way that your brain develops and there are natural stages that it should go through. So I think with these gadgets, there's a danger of overstimulation. 
in a sense, right? So, uh, and also these gadgets in a way. What, what does it do to the brain? What is the brain? Yes. So, of course, with, with this overstimulation, it changes the neural networks, right? So, a brain is basically a system of networks and impulses that cause through. So, I think it changes the neural networks, right? So, for example, if you expose a child to something and you condition the child every day, it becomes a habit, true? It's like it's like addiction in the yeah. sense, yeah? How do yeah. you develop addictions, right? It's exposure, repetitive patterns, mm. and then you get hooked, right? Yeah. The same way we learn, by repetition, yeah? It's the same way AI learns, machine learning, by repetition mimicry. Mm. So, there is a way in which children are socialized normally, right? The first intimate attachments are usually with your parents, and then with your siblings, if you have siblings, mm. and then from there, with other children in the playground, mm. and then from there, the school setting. And now, how you socialize there will determine adult relationships in more than one way is true. So the danger with these gadgets is sometimes it provides, it provides overstimulation and solitary pursuits, meaning you, f you focus more on in self-indulgence than in relating and interacting with the wider world. Mm. True? So if you're playing video games uh, six hours <coughs> a day, so what happens to your interaction with other children? right mm. yeah so there can be social deficits to it true and now of course uh, so is it more medical or social it's social it's more social opinion. more social in my opinion okay i want to get to the books and uh this conversation today we are hosting it at the noria bookstore which is the leading online bookstore in kenya and they've stocked all this uh france's books so i want to journey through every single book and understanding the thoughts and the reflections and the perspectives behind what put together that book. But also, Franz, when you are putting together the first book, Banda's War, mm. when you are starting to write something, to scribble something in your notebook, mm. you had a goal that it was going to end up in a book. Mm. What was that process from the moment you conceptualized the idea? And mm. this I'm asking for the benefit of whoever is listening or watching us today okay. who has a design in the heart to one day I want to write a book. Okay. But they don't know. Today, maybe when you look at your ninth or 10th or 18th mm. manuscript, you're getting used. It's a pattern. You 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 know what to do. But the first one is always the key one. Mm. How did you nav navigate and, and, and how did you end up publishing the, the, your first book, Banda's War? So this is the first hard copy book I'd, uh, that uh, I'd published. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually books, the idea for a book can come from different forms. First of all, it can come from an unresolved conflict. Secondly, it could possibly come from a discussion. And uh, a lot of these books I've written came from discussions that were unresolved, right? So Banda's War, for example, is a play that I wrote out of an argument I had with my younger brother, Dylan, and my mother. So I was in second year medical school, and uh, we, were discussing, we were discussing the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, right? And the, and the rebellion in heaven. And my mother is devoutly religious. Uh, however, uh, you can be raised in the church, but with time, you might you might start seeing the world from a different point of view when you remove faith from religion and try to look at it from an aspect of pure cold, cold logic, right? So a conflict begins to arise, right? So I asked my mom, is it possible that the nature of redemption is something that we might be constraining? And this was in relevance to man and angels. So I asked her, if God can forgive man, despite all his faults, repetitively. Yeah? Imagine a fallen angel deciding to branch away from Satan and to go back to heaven and seek redemption. Is it in their purview? And of course she said that it is, it is, not, beyond the, it is not in their purview because they were perfect. We have an excuse because we're imperfect and it's hereditary. It's a hereditary kind of sin. But they were perfect and blemished, so they don't have an excuse. Therefore they are damned, right? And so the idea started sifting in my mind and started wondering, what if there's a demon out there that wants to become an angel again? 
what if there's a demon out there is cognizant of the fact that they made a mistake by following Satan? Mm. Is there a road back to heaven? Or are they damned? So that's what brought the idea of Banda's War. Mm. So it's basically a story revolving around the nature of redemption mm. and also the nature of perfection. So another question I asked, what is perfection? Is perfection uh, in a way just physical, meaning that we can live for eternity? Or is perfection something that permeates everything? Mm. Moral, spiritual, and physical, right? Or, and what is the nature of evil? So how is it that evil came to be? Mm. So there are two, there are two, there are two conclusions that I came up with, mm. right? One, it's either that evil was in existence even before God created man. Or two, man created, or rather, God created men with the potential for evil. So why would you create human beings with the potential for evil? Isn't, it, isn't that like a double-edged sword? And on top of that, another theme that is discussed is free will mm. and determinism. Uh, in many ways, I do not believe in free will. I believe things have already been set in stone mm. in more ways than one. Free will, in some ways, I think, is a fallacy to give ourselves the idea that we're in control. Yeah. Yes. But that and more are discussed. So another thing, what is the value of self-destructive free will? Why would Adam and Eve throw away a paradise in Eden to exert free will, but at the same time die in the process? Mm -hmm. Is that really free will? if it's fatalistic. You've given a dedication to three people, your brother Paul, your brother Dylan, and your nephew Paris. How did they inspire your writing in this way? Uh, so my brother Dylan is actually one of the, one of the proponents. Yeah. So my mom kept uh, uh, of the argument. While we were having this argument, my mom kept quoting scripture. And we kept telling her mom, just, just put those scriptures aside and let's just think logically. Right? Mm -hmm. Put out your put away your faith. Assume I'm an atheist, yeah? yeah. And you explain this to me using cold hard logic. Right? Yeah. But uh Dylan was part of part of uh the band, my band <laughs> of, of many rebels yeah. who are trying to make my mom see things from our point of view. Mm -hmm. So in many ways he inspired it. Uh my brother my brother Paul, Paul my brother Paul is unlike me, uh, a voice of reason. He's very calm, very collected, and he's He's, in some ways, you might think he's dispassionate if you don't know him well. Mm. So I, I channeled him in some of the arguments here because sometimes writing a book, you have to have differing points of views mm. and you cannot make your stances completely biased True, mm. We have to weigh both sides, right? So there is a passionate stand by one character and then there has to be the level-headed counter-argument, right? Mm. So when I, when I write level-headed counter-arguments, I channeled my older brother, Paul. Mm. So also my nephew Paris had been, I think he'd been born and I wanted to give something to the newborn boy and also to, as a thank you to his mother mm. for bringing him to the world. <laughs> so from Banda's war, you went to the chief must die and yeah. other stories. Chief Tell us die. about the chief must die and other stories. So the chief must die and other stories, yeah. if I can hold it. Yeah. The chief must die and other stories is I think my eighth book here. Yeah? So this is a beautiful book because it came and was born out of rejection. So like I told you before, before I delved into, into publishing and starting my own company, I have traversed the streets of this city. Mm. So in, uh, and I have endured so much heartbreak. So I've been rejected in almost every publishing house mm. known in the city, right? And uh, this collection of short stories came as a result of, uh, of, of, of the enduring spirit that I decided to foster. And also, I realized that if I'm not going to get published, maybe I'm not being taken seriously because I'm not famous enough, maybe. So I sought out to maybe try to increase my publicity by trying to win a writing competition of sorts, right? Mm. So, uh, I started writing short stories that I submitted into competitions. So the chief, the uh, Ground to Dust was the first story I wrote, which is about the post-election violence, right, of 207. I submitted it to a competition, never won. Next, I went to Man Enough, which discusses masculinity. I submitted it to a collection, to a competition, never won. The next thing I wrote was Kamikaze Misdirect, which is about terrorism, modern day terrorism, 
in Kenya. I submitted it, never won. I, then I went to an uncertain destination that discussed the 1982 coup. I submitted that one, I never won. Then I went to Under the Blue Blood Moon, which discusses a topic that I think we don't delve into as much, the era of the gigolo, right? The kept man. Mm -hmm. So it discusses the story of a gentleman who is in financial straits, who tries to marry into a rich family to sort his debts. So it was an interesting story, but of course uh, it never, I never won anything from it. And uh, the next one was Through the Fire, a story about cancer. And this was one of the thing, one of one of the things I wanted to put into perspective out of my experiences as a doctor. So Through the Fire is a story about two cancer patients who fall in love with each other. Mm. But the problem is they have a cancer that is hereditary. So if they get a child, there's a 50% chance the child will get cancer. So do they take that risk? We love and endure, or do they leave each other? So by this time, I've just completed my internship. So I'm a village doctor in some place I'm sure you've never heard of. Yeah. Where is this? So it's a place called Olmoran. Yeah. It's between the border of of bar of bar of uh, like Kipi and Baringo. So it's basically has the pastoral communities, the Samburus, the Pokots, and a bit of the Kikuyu community. Mm. Yeah. So while I was there, uh, as I said, I was a village doctor. Uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> and of course, I'm exploring a side of the world I have never seen before. Yeah. Right? You can imagine children of the age of 10 walking around with a hundred, a, a herd of cattle, now numbering a hundred mm. with an AK-47 sling on their, mm. on their back. Mm. So it's like another world. Right? But uh, actually, I was the first doctor to be ever posted there. Because every doctor they kept sending refused to go mm. because they felt it was a bit too insecure. But uh, in my mindset, I decided if we, create, if we continue having this habit of refusing this call to duty, mm. who will actually help these people, <clears throat> right? Because someone has to do it, right? So yeah. I decided to be a pioneer. So there was a facility? There's a facility. Had equipment? Had relatively. Yeah. Yes. And doctors kept turning down? Kept turning down. The posting so i decided i think what people need is someone to oh what's the word for it a beacon if they see that someone has gone there and has worked there successfully mm -hmm. and came out in relatively good health you can encourage other people to do it when my time comes to leave yeah right so it was an experience that was very rewarding i must say and it also gave me some time to draft this book yeah so the first one of the the title of this book actually yeah called the chief must die mm. is based on the story one of my grandmothers told me my paternal grandmother Philomena Arodi I mean she rest in peace mm. right so like I told you my grandmothers have had, had a very very uh, influential role mm. in my in my uh, in my journey as a writer so the chief must die is basically a retelling of the story of Luanda Magere this is a story <laughs> that we've been told before and before and before but. As my elder brother says, the beauty of writing a, to a story that has been retold mm -hmm. is that you create a perspective that someone hasn't come, come up with. But also that makes it difficult. Yeah. Because everyone has a preconceived idea of what the story should be. Yeah. Yes. The chief must die. The chief must so die. So it's a collection of your short stories. My short stories. Okay. Yes. With differing themes. All right. Then I go to All the Old Gods. Tell us about All the Old Gods. So, All the Old Gods is a story, is a collection of short stories, or rather an anthology of essays and short stories that I decided to compile with a group, a group of cherished friends. So when I got my, my, my tenth, when I got my tenth book, I started feeling like my writing was becoming monotonous, monotonous right? Mm. So I wanted something fresh, something different, and I had to give it a new feel. So I decided, let me work with some people. But of course, uh, enlisting people on this project took a while because mm -hmm. there's an element of self-doubt, yeah? So you approach someone and tell them there's this collection I'm working on. Would you want to contribute? Uh, they say yes, and then they ghost you for three for three <laughs> weeks. And also there's an the element of maybe they don't feel like they're good enough. But mm -hmm. I kept telling them that uh, the one unique thing that you have that no one else can reproduce is the fact that you are who you are. Mm -hmm. You express yourself the way you express yourself. And that in itself makes you special. And that's what I'm looking for, yeah. right? So I think it was in 2017, we were in Langata in the, waiting to celebrate the new year. 
with uh, some friends of mine. So there's a lady called Wanjiko Irungu, mm. a very good friend of mine. I've known her since I was 16. Yeah. They'd come for some benchmarking in Alliance and we met there. Mm. Her brother, George Gadiani, who was also in Alliance with me, mm. but he was a few years behind us. Uh, a gentleman called Basil Ibrahim, a lady called Daisy Okoti, and a gentleman called Nelson Omech, who works with my elder sister. Mm. So I decided to enlist these people to produce something that would be different. So everyone here has a different speciality, mm. right? So for example, Wanjiko Irungu is uh, quite adept at discussing uh, the psychology of, of, or rather criminal mind when it relates to women. Mm. Yeah, so, uh, When she relates to women and crimes of passion and psychopathy. Mm. So she has a way of weaving stories that revolve around female villains. And on the other hand, George Gadiani is a brilliant essayist. Uh, there's nothing he can't write actually. In fact, in many ways, I've nurtured him, but I also admire him simultaneously. Mm. So he was discussing an essay about racism. And since he's studied abroad, he has some unique experience on it, yeah, mm. that he could deliver, right? Daisy Okoti discussed an aspect that I don't think we put into perspective enough. In many ways, we blame our fathers and men for ruining families, but we never really discussed the theme of an absentee mother. So Daisy was bringing up the issue of absentee mothers and the effect they have on children in a short story. So Nelson Omech is also an essayist from Uganda. Mm. We've written three books with him. And he was discussing the element of, if I can remember, the element of capitalism and communism. Mm. And the reason why capitalism trumps communism in form of an economic model that can bring out Africa from the depths of poverty. Yeah, mm. <coughs> a moment. And also for me, I decided now to do what I do best, which was write a folklore again. Mm. So this folklore was also inspired by one of my grandmothers, may she rest in peace, the Damaris, uh, Damaris Ondijo. And it's about a gentleman called Nyamgodo. If there are any laws here, mm. I'm sure you've heard of this story, yes. right? Yes, Nyamgodo. Nyamgodo, yes. yes. So I decided to rewrite this story in my own version. So Nyamgodo is the story of a man who was burdened by incredible laziness, right? But in some ways, I want to humanize this man. Because in mental health, we do not want to demonize people. Yeah, We want to understand why you are the way you are. Mm. So you can work through in your betterment, true? Mm. So Nyamgodo is presented by an offer that he cannot refuse but the expense of his soul. So in, at the end of the story, I want you to consider whether it would be worth it and whether you do the same in his shoes. Mm. Yes. Tell me about the title, All the Old Gods. Where did that come from? So, the title of the story of Nyamgodo that I, retold, that I retold and rewrote mm. is actually called All the Old Gods. So the idea is, I wanted to bring to light the fact that in some ways, as we've adopted Christianity, have we forsaken the old gods? Because we believed in a god before the white man came, true? Before Islam came to the shores of, of Africa, we believed in our own gods. We had our, our own systems of worship, right? So in many ways, have we forsaken the old gods and substituted them with the new? Is there a way we can integrate the old and the new? Mm. And would we be forfeiting the new? Or offending the new by integrating the old. From 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 where you sit, when you reflect on it generally, yes. have we? Have we? Mm. Hmm. To be honest with you, and uh, this uh, this might be taken out of turn, but <coughs> I think, I think, the moment religion became interspersed with politics. In more ways than one, it lost it lost a sense of authenticity, right? Uh, it is believed that that the Romans widely accepted Catholicism, not Catholicism, Christianity, mm -hmm. because they believed that a Christian is easier to control, easier to govern, right? The Zealots in Israel were a race of warriors, right? And, it was de and they kept rebelling against the Roman Empire. But the tenets of Christianity, if you look at them carefully, yeah, promote respecting the governments of the time, promote 
paying taxes and giving unto Caesar, promote turning the other cheek when wronged. So in reality, you're creating a society of meek sheep who will follow our rules, mm. even though it goes against their uh, their elemental freedoms. So if we can divorce religion from politics, mm. because in many ways also, religion has been used to endorse politicians, mm. right? Mm. If I can give another example, if you look at the times of kings, when we had kings, and especially if we, if we delve into the British monarchy, yeah. which is something I've studied extensively, mm. I think there was a pact between the church and the church and royalty. So the idea was, right, if you can make the peasantry believe that our right to rule is God-given and divine, it will not. It will reduce dissidents mm. and reduce the idea that kings can be accountable to men, right? So it's very, it's a very, it's a very unbalanced relationship when you question your king for for misdeeds, mm. because in that line you would be questioning God's personification on earth, right? So religion in itself is actually a very good thing. It grounds humanity. It provides morality tenets of right and wrong, doctrines to live by, mm. which is a great thing. But I feel that the moment religion and politics is merged, in a way it loses its essence. Don't you think religion in its own nature is, mm. is political? In, in, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because when, going back to the story where you started mm. of Satan and being expelled from mm. It's hard to, def to, 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 to separate it politically mm. Mm. because there was power. Somebody was seeking power mm. and then they were expelled. Mm. They went and created another kingdom mm. which they rule. Mm. They are trying to win souls and people and support. Mm. So it's political in its own very nature. True. But when, when, when I hear, for example, something you've said that has interested me is where did it all begin? For example, when you look at the, 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 the monarchy hmm. and, 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 and this whole extent of the British rule, hmm. which has inspired or rather influenced most of what we practice in Africa and especially the countries that were colonized by Britain. Mm. The constitution, mm. the approach to leadership, mm. and for a very long time, up to just a generation above us, mm. were still answerable to the king and the queen in England. Mm. When I reflected to us, and just going beyond religion, Mm. There is an argument of, ah, they brought education. They brought clothes. They brought decency. Forwardness. Where is the gap between this newness mm. and what existed before? Mm. So, I'd like to start with a quote here. Yeah? History is written by the people who hanged our heroes. And let's start from there. Yeah. Another quote. Until the lion begins to tell its tale, the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So a lot of history has been whitewashed. Yeah. And I use that word deliberately, whitewashed, yeah. right? Yeah. And the aspects of ourselves that were really devalued, right? Or omitted. Mm -hmm. uh, Phoenicians came all the way to Africa. Mm. Yeah, uh, the Romans came all the way. The Greeks came all the way mm. to learn astrology, to learn elements of architecture mm. because of the pyramids, mm. right? To learn arithmetic, right? Which is the basics of basics of most of all fundamental knowledge, mm. right? Mm. And they came to learn from scholars in Africa, right? Uh, there's a gentleman called Mansa Musa. You heard of him? So Mansa Musa was uh, believed to be one of the most wealthiest men in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
dating to the pre pre pre, pre uh, not even pre colonial predating the arrival of the white man on our shores mm-hmm. right and it's actually believed that he he on his travel to mecca he traveled with so much gold that the price of gold was devalued so you can believe how wealthy this man was but those are not stories that we hear mm-hmm. we only hear about the fact that we were naked mm-hmm. that we did not have vaccines mm-hmm. that we were backward right so the question is why did they come all this way to learn from us mm-hmm. if we had nothing to offer why have they stayed here this long if we have nothing to offer mm-hmm. why do they prevent us from uh asserting ourselves politically if we have nothing to offer why do they keep creating generations of mini colonialists through the leaders that they put as puppets in africa mm-hmm. if we have nothing to offer why is the transcendence of the black man so scary for them how much does france pilfer from west africa per year if you put a value on it over 500 billion yeah. pilfered right why are these against these coups in west africa if you think about it now i'd say colonization in many ways has influenced us both for good and bad if you take my first name my name is franz it's a german name why on earth do i have a german name and i asked my father this question why, why, why would you not give me five black proud low names why do i have a white name right mm. so he said because it's what your brother wanted mm. yeah however i told him no let's not deflect let's get to the core of the matter because i don't see white people taking up our names yeah. if anything the i see african americans in the diaspora taking up swahili names mm. to get a sense a sense of identity mm. and to be rooted to the african okay. heritage yeah. but i do not see caucasians having our names true so in the road to modernity how much have we battered away how much have we battered away mm. is there a possibility or a way in which we can hold on to our african roots mm. at the same time embrace modernity yeah mm. and not give everything away in the name of progress i saw i saw a, an article the other day where the asante kingdom mm. in ghana was being loaned artifacts that were stolen during that colonial era mm. that were kept in the british museum and now because they needed the this current generation to learn something about them mm. the british museum was loaning the the artifacts to the asante kingdom this is like last month mm. i heard about it also and and when i think about things like that with with the with the context of what you're talking about do we have a voice of the african people to say this is where this thing began now i think the problem began the problem began was when we implicitly accepted that they were better than us right mm. and when they made us feel inferior and made us feel ashamed about our background and our way of life that's where the problem began ideally so if you look at if you look at uh, afrofuturism for example let's take the black panther if you watch the movie yes i have yes so one thing i loved about the black panther is there's a way of portraying us and it's also a way i've really tried to portray us in the books i write right mm. so i do not want to portray victimhood the mentality that will always be at the mercy mm. of the western world and that we need to be saved right and that's why as much as i write fiction i'll try to incorporate essayists who discuss real tangible things mm-hmm. like if you take all the old gods yeah, yeah. nelson omech is discussing capitalism uh, vis-a-vis communism and socialism mm. right and what is in a sense more practical if you want to pull africa out of the depths of darkness right mm-hmm. if you take another sto- another book here uh there's one of the essays called judy caria so she discusses globalization mm-hmm. right and the effect it's having on a shrinking world right mm-hmm. and with the uh, gentlemen such as donald trump and their views on immigration and with the hostility that it's bringing in the western world yeah. is globalization going to be phased out eventually right and if you look at another book a collection one of the essays written by one of my authors judy carrie again mm. she discusses the united states of africa is it feasible 
and what frameworks do you need to create? So what I believe is, yeah. I believe we need a economic revolution, first of all. Because I cannot, I cannot, I cannot negotiate with a first world country as a single African country. Mm. We need to have a united bloc as Africans, yeah. right? To negotiate with strength. So I believe in many ways, if we can create inter-African regional blocks with trade and systems where we move freely, we trade freely, right? And a lot depend on all or larger uh, uh, a monetary system that is controlled by the West. Mm. It all begins by economic freedom. When you when you can afford what you want, right? You can actually do what you want. And even if you're sanctioned, because the West loves sanctions. Mm. It's the way of controlling and taming us, right? If you don't toe the line, we sanction you. But if we depend on ourselves, the sanctions will be meaningless. Don't you agree? So it all begins with economic freedom. So after economic freedom, now we create a reform of the mind, mm. in a sense. And I think from there, Africa would liberate itself. Yeah. But it all begins with the economics. I want to quickly rush through the... Because there's quite a bit to talk about yes. in, 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 in the books that you've written. Yes, yes. So I want to quickly rush through them just to get a quick synopsis of uh, So you, By Their Fruits, is also a collection of so short stories. Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. Tell us about By Their Fruits. So, By Their Fruits is uh, one of the first books I wrote under the, comp uh, under the publishing company I started mm. called Wanderers Path Publishers. So as usual, I wanted to work with different authors. I wanted to have a different voice, different feel to avoid monotony and create diversity and also to give a chance for authors to launch their careers, right? Mm. And uh, as usual, I delve into different themes, be they essays or short stories. So Wanjiko Irungu, mm. who I've written other books with, yeah. like I told you, she has a penchant for discussing the female psyche, mm. especially when it comes to female villains. So I wanted her to give a perspective, which she did very well, right? Mm. In a story called Full Circle. So Nelson Omech, who is an essayist I've also worked with, mm. wrote an essay called The 80 Chains of Gold. Yeah. And if you allow me, yeah. he discusses something called escape velocity. So the idea of escape velocity is, uh, it's a term in, in physics. So when, uh, when a rocket is leaving Earth, right, there's a certain amount of thrust it has to generate mm. to overcome the gravitational field mm -hmm. so it can break loose into the stratosphere right so he was discussing what are the things that are holding africa back yeah what is the gravitational pull that is keeping us where we are mm. is it our leaders is it lack of innovative thinking mm. yeah is it our is it our idolatry towards the west right and what do we need to propel further from there there's an essay by judy Carey about globalization which I think I'd already mentioned, right? With the West becoming more and more hostile towards immigration and immigrants, and they feel that the benefits are being taken by people who are not uh, original members of their countries, mm. do we feel like the world is becoming smaller in more ways than one? Mm. Yeah. And another thing, what if we were to mimic their form of hostility? What if we were to prevent Caucasians, and not only Caucasians, all foreigners from intermingling, yeah? and moving and working and trading here. Mm -hmm. What if we were to do the same? What if we were to create restrictions for the West, for West, the Western world to operate in Africa and in our shores? Yeah. So what if we did what they do, but in a more grander scale? No. Now from there, uh -huh. George Gaviani uh, wrote a short story about drug abuse, mm -hmm. right? Which is a theme I think is relevant to this generation of ours in which we use recreational drugs mm. and end up addicted. I wrote a short story called By Their Fruits, which is also the title of this book. Mm. So By Their Fruits was influenced by my experience as a psychiatrist. So before I graduated, when I was doing my master's, I used to see families. I used to see patients dealing with mental health issues. But I always wondered, we only focus on the patients, but what do they affect what is the effect of mental health on the families of these people? How does it destabilize them? What adaptations do they need to make, right? Uh, what kind of rifts do they create in a marital setup? 
right? So you can imagine someone who is in the throes of a mental illness, who has no control, mm-hmm. yeah, over how they act, over decision making sometimes, right? And what kind of compromise does it require someone, a man or woman, to be with such a spouse or to entertain such a child? True. So it, I wrote this book in the perspective of a family. So by the fruit is a story of a family in which a man marries a woman, but she does not disclose that she has a mental health condition. Mm. And after they have a child, the child shows elements of a mental health condition. Mm. And that's what makes her actually fess up. So the idea is, yeah, will he accommodate her? Will they find a new normal? And or will this be the backdrop of marital dissolution? There's been a very big debate on mental health. Yes. And uh, there are people who say the more advanced the world is getting, Mm. the higher the cases of mental health. Mm. What is the relationship from your psychiatristic point of view? So what I think... What I think is, uh, for a long time, mental health issues have always been there, but it's just that we've not been able to identify it, yeah? So when you don't identify something, you rely on superstition. Like, I'll give a very good example. I'm from, I'm from Nyanza. We, we all, we've all had relatives who act a bit strange, are a bit off, but we find a way to explain away their behavior. Oh, nani, the, joka nani are just like that, mm. yeah? Joko dongo just have tempers. That's mm. how they are, mm. right? Uh, 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 Jokouma, sometimes they talk to themselves, but they're not bad people, right? And when you do not have an explanation, because by the time you're saying that, it's a pattern that you see. Mm. So you, you dub it into a character trait. But that's actually maybe a symptomatology of a mental illness. Mm. But now, when as Africans, when you do not have a way to explain something, mm. now we lean back to superstition, yeah? Yeah. Uh, Kinauma now, which they practice witchcraft. You even remember her great grandmother mm. was removed from the village. Mm. So now an issue of also awareness, right? If there's no awareness, it also reduces the amount of people who are diagnosed. Don't you think? If we don't screen enough, it reduces the amount of people who are diagnosed. True. So what I believe is, as early as our parents' generation, right? Mental health wasn't something that was taken seriously, right? But now with the awareness, mm. with more screening programs. Yeah, with more material out there, yeah, with more avenues to get diagnosed, we are becoming more cognizant. Mm. So I wouldn't say that it's a new thing. I just say that we are more aware of it. I want to go back to an example you've used. Yes. Jokodongo have tempers. Jokodongo have tempers. Is it transferable generationally from parent to child to it can be. So uh the the there are conditions there are conditions that have something called mood dysregulation, right? So you might find people have outbursts, right? Or are extremely aggressive, right? And it comes with an Im- with impulsivity and regret after. So that's some one of the symptomatologies of bipolar mood disorder, for example, right? Mm. However, for you to be diagnosed, and this is something we should get straight as a society, mm. I cannot cherry pick one symptom you have and, con- and uh, say or diagnose you with a condition. By the time we diagnose you, you have to fit a certain core features in a spectrum, mm-hmm. yeah? So if there are seven symptoms of bipolar mood disorder, you have to fit at least five out of seven mm-hmm. for me to comfortably say, yeah? I don't think one would be enough, mm-hmm. true? Because otherwise it'd be misdiagnosing a lot of people. But back to your point, some of these mental illnesses are hereditary and they are transferable to the next generation, yes. How, genetically or what? Genetically. The, just by virtue of having the same genes, they are transferable. But another thing that we have to consider is you do not develop an illness. You mm. develop a vulnerability. So you might find some in a scenario that I have, I've, gen, I've developed, I have inherited the gene to develop bipolar. Mm. However, I grew up in an environment that does not make the gene express itself, right? So let's say I, I am born into a world with a platinum spoon and I've never lacked for anything, mm. and my stressors are all controlled, it's highly unlikely that I will develop, or rather, not to develop, express the gene, mm. yeah, that now becomes an overt form of mental illness, right? However, on the other hand, you can imagine, I inherit the, the, the gene for bipolar, I'm an orphan by the time I'm nine, 
I join a gang by the time I'm 13. I'm living on the streets from the time I'm 13 to 18. All I've known is criminality and pain. Mm. What are the chances that this gene will not express itself? Very likely. True? So it's a, a balance and interplay between genetics and environment. Mm. Genetics and environment. With that in hindsight. Yes. Tell me about trauma. Trauma. How does it affect the brain? How does it influence? Because looking at a majority of, um, let me say, some of the diagnoses I've, I've, I've had or I've seen people present, and mm. they say, I didn't know I was suffering this out of what happened to me as a child. Mm. So an adult today, you have fears, you have, you have reservations on certain things, mm. which are a result of certain experiences you had as a child. Mm. But you never realized them until you sat with somebody mm. and while relieving some of those moments mm -hmm. is when you realize that, ah, I didn't see that. In the, in the African society, I wouldn't even say traditional because even currently there are a lot of people who don't believe that mental illness is something that exists. Mm. There are people who believe that, ah, that person is just lazy. Ah, that person just seeks attention. Oh, that person is just this and that. And, we, and people have ended up profiling mm. incidences that could easily, and, and maybe not extreme cases, mm. you know. But because of that space, people are meant to behave in a particular way. People mm. are forced mm. to ignore Mm. Some of those things that you would call symptoms that mm. would ideally would have helped somebody get help. Mm. It is in that context that I would like to understand trauma mm. and how it influences or how it plays out mm. mental illness. So, uh, basically, yeah, uh, when 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 a person is confronted by something that is either extremely emotive or is capable of disorienting their psyche, right? We protect ourselves using something called defense mechanisms. So defense mechanisms are psychological hacks that help you control the anxiety that is precipitated by something that was extremely chaotic or traumatic, right? Mm. So I'll take you through a few mm. defense mechanisms. And it is when these defense mechanisms do not work that now mental health and illness now becomes overt. Mm. Or in some times, if these defense mechanisms are immature, they present as elements of mental illness. Mm. So for example, one defense mechanism. So we'll start with trauma. Mm. Something happened to you while you're a young man. You've never really dealt with it. But now it is affecting how you deal and relate with people. Mm. So the psychologist Carl, uh, called Carl Jung, who believes that... Uh, what we resist persists. Just because you've swept something under your subconscious does not mean that it is dead. It only creeps back in subtle, indirect ways mm. in interactions in daily life. So there's one defense mechanism called suppression. So suppression is when you actively put aside feelings you have to get an uncomfortable task done. Mm. So I'll give you an example. I'm a medical doctor. During internship, uh, Labor ward was a quite an experience, I must say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. seeing women give birth in their most vulnerable state was a was a very uncomfortable experience, right? Yeah. So, uh, my rotation in maternity was not fun, mm -hmm. right? Because the women are trying to deliver babies, and of course they are very vulnerable, and of course they're in pain, right? So you can imagine that environment, right? Mm -hmm. So of course for me I didn't find it very comfortable, but it was part of the job, right? Mm -hmm. So my ability to push through my personal feelings to get the job done, mm. that is suppression, right? Yeah. The ability to endure a boss you do not like mm. just to get a job done, that is suppression. Now, the beauty of suppression is you consciously know you're doing it. Mm. Now, let us go to repression. Repression is when you unconsciously 
put aside or sweep aside something mm. that you're not psychologically ready to deal with. Mm. Right? There are, there are scenarios of people who've undergone sexual assault, for example. Yeah. Right? And when they're being interviewed, or rather, when we're taking a history from them, they cannot remember the event. You've heard of such scenarios? Yes. They cannot remember it. In fact, they're told what happened to them. However, years later, after they go through therapy and they begin to heal their fractured minds, flashes of what happened keep coming back. Mm. So the question is, why is it that at that moment in time, they were unable to recollect the events? Possibly it's because at that moment in time, they were too fragile or they were, they were so fragile that if they were to accept everything in totality, it would overwhelm them mm. and they'd go insane. So their mind protected them by locking away this memory in a box until they are ready to face it, right? Other defense mechanisms. Let me ask, in that scenario, Yes. your mind, what, what is it that is controlling your mind to lock this thing that knows our oh, Franz is vulnerable? Pardon? Now, Franz cannot deal with this issue. Mm. It locks it. It's, it's autonomous, right? It's, it's an autonomous system, right? Because also, by this time, you have your habits, you have your traits, you have your ideals, the things you believe in, right? So by the time, by the time you decide to act on something, it's because you've delib- your mind has deliberately allowed you to act on it. Mm. By the time you avoid something and have a phobia, it's because your mind knows that you're deliberately afraid of this. Mm. And so your mind also has a check and balance that weighs things. And, and since it's part of you, yeah, that element of, of it knows you almost better than you know yourself. So it discriminates. Is this something that you can handle? Mm. Or is this something beyond you? Or is this something that you're still not ready to handle right now? Mm. Right? Mm. Projection. Another defense mechanism. So let's say that you are bullied as a young man. You are bullied a lot in uh, primary school or high school. Mm. And so you decide to... You decide to... Join martial arts. Tough enough, yeah. Yeah, so that's another form of of defense mechanism, but that is a mature form, yeah. right? When you take uh, undesirable or unapproved forms of expression into a societal, societally approved form. So instead of punching people on the streets, mm. I take up martial arts and learn discipline and self-control. True? Now, there are people who decide not to handle things maturely. So I join a gym and start bullying people mm. and starting start having uh, starting fights in clubs. So I've never really dealt with the fact that my masculinity was harmed mm. and I felt vulnerable and I did not like how I felt. Mm. And so I want to dominate other men mm. to prove to myself that I am strong. Yeah. Projecting. So there are so many defense mechanisms you can go through. But now in the sense of trauma, or the topic of trauma that you're discussing, yeah. right? If I was traumatized, what defense mechanisms are at play that are helping me reduce the anxiety? Mm. Are they mature or are they immature? And if they are immature, how do they reflect? I hope I've answered your question in a way. Wow. Yes. I, I, it's fascinating to think yes. about how the brain works. And now, now I, I want to engage even more. You who study the brain more. But I want to move on because I'm, I'm determined to, to talk about all your books. Okay. Simbi. Okay. So Simbi. Simbi is uh, another collection that we wrote. And uh, it's also published by my publishing company. So as usual, I decided to enlist my group of trusted friends. Mm. Since we have history with each other, we have a good working relationship. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to micromanage them. Mm. Right? So we'll start with the essays, right? Yeah. So... Actually, no, let's start with let's start with the essays. Mm. The Road to Damascus. The Road to Damascus is an essay by Nelson Omech, one of my friends who mm. is also a Ugandan. So Nelson Omech discussed the idea of how man changes, right? Once a man enters a river, does he come out as the same man or is he totally changed? What do you think? In your perspective. Depends with which river. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not Nairobi River. Yeah. So let's assume. Yeah. So take it metaphorically. Mm. When a man enters a river, mm. does he come out the same man or is he forever changed? Are you the same person that you were five years ago? Are you the same man that you were yesterday? Or are you a sum total of your experiences? 
I would say you're not the same person. Or are you still transitioning into something else? Personally, from my point of view, yes. you're always transitioning into something else. Okay. You're always transitioning into something new. Okay. Because your your perspectives, your approach to things are shaped by the things, a sum total of what you have this far mm. versus what you're going to face. The next decision you're going to make is based on your experiences, what has worked, what has failed. Okay. You remember that theory of the monkey mm. and, and the banana? Mm. The, the, the monkey, a banana was placed somewhere. And the first monkey, every time it was reaching uh, out to that banana, it was water with so much pressure was flushed at it and, and it kept falling. It kept falling. It kept trying and falling that it gave up. Then when other monkeys came, mm. who had not had an experience with that water, mm. when they are trying to reach out to the banana, it is that first monkey that kept telling them, guys, don't go. Mm. No monkey ended up eating that banana. Mm. Despite the other monkeys that joined later, mm. not even attempting to do anything with that banana. Mm. We in that society where there are people who've gone ahead of us, who've time again, again say, mm. no, don't do that. Don't go there. And, and sometimes because of the fear of the unknown, mm. you take up that decision and say, hey, if so-and-so has said that thing, mm. I will not going, I'm not going to do it. There are places you've been. Talk about, for example, romantic relationships. Mm. They say Nairobi is, is, is the home of heartbreaks. If you've not been heartbroken in Nairobi, <laughs> you don't exist. Those experiences from your previous relationship informs how you view this new person. They, may, they, they don't even know each other. They've never even met. But the experiences you got... When you look at this thing, the new place you are in, it influences how you look at things. So that makes me believe that we are always in transition. And experiences shape how we think, how we reason, how we look at things. Okay. Yeah. I'll give a very good example. So in this essay by Nelson Omech, yeah, I'd like to read something for you. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing at murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any, there who belonged to the way, whether man or woman, he might take them as prisoner to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So, in essence, right? Let's say I'm a devout Christian. Let's say my mom is a devout Christian. She's the most devout of us, right? And she met Saul on the way to Damascus, right? But Saul had become Paul, right? Mm -hmm. But she's heard so many terrible things about Paul, about yes. Saul. And now there's this Paul trying to preach Christianity to yes. us. What would her perception be? How lying. is she supposed to take him? Yeah. Do I take the Saul who's been killing us? Mm. Or do I take this new Paul discussing redemption? Or is this a ruse just to, just to lure me somewhere and kill me? Mm. Like you've done for so many others. <laughs> yes. Now, another example is there's something called the ship of... It's a, it's, it's, it's a question that has really baffled philosophers. I'm looking for the right term. The ship of Theseus. Mm. So the ship of Theseus gives a an example. So let us assume that a ship leaves a port and while it's on the way, the parts of the ship keep getting replaced. Mm -hmm. Sim so simultaneously as the ship is traveling, right? So by the time it gets to point, point B from point A, all the parts have been removed, right? So is it, is the, is it the same ship that left the port? No, it's not. It has baffled philosophers for centuries. It's not a simple question. So I don't expect an immediate answer. Maybe you can ruminate on it. I want to think as a layman, not a philosopher, the ship that left the port has some parts missing. Yes. But in essence, yeah. what makes the ship? Is the ship the parts in itself? Or is the ship the captain and the crew? Right? Is the ship the purpose of the travel or the voyage? So you could think of it physically in terms of the parts of the ship. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you could think of the purpose of the ship. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you could think of the people that make the ship what it is in totality. Yeah. So if the captain and the crew remain, but the parts of the ship change, is the ship the same? Right? Another thing. So if there was a different captain midway and the parts were removed, what does it change? I know, it's a complex question. I, I choose to just look at it 
from a very logical perspective and and from me okay. how i would look at it i would okay. say the ship that left the port is missing some parts okay by the time it reaches its destination okay so so in essence right take man to be a ship right yeah who i was when i was when i just when i just left the lands mm. that young cocky confident man yeah, yeah? To the person I became when I was humbled in medical school, mm. to the person I became when I was even humbled more when I went for my masters, mm. right? To the person who was humbled by all the rejection before I published these books, mm. am I still the same man? Now that's complex. Am I still the same, Franz? Yes and no. That that is the right answer. Yes and no. A man can be simultaneously condemned and absolved. And that was the moral of this essay. Like Saul and Paul. Franz. Let me go through Simbi. Yes. Before we continue. So Simbi. So are we again? Uh, that was that essay by Nelson. So Judy Caria mm -hmm. wrote an essay on on uh, what was this? What was this? United States of Africa. So what do we need to kill the United States of Africa? Mm -hmm. Should we focus more on a political system? Should we focus more on regional blocks? But for her, she was discussing the economics of it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not an economist. So I just advise you to buy the book and read whoever is watching mm -hmm. uh, to understand the frameworks that could be necessary to make Africa a united block. Mm -hmm. The next one is uh, a story by Stephen Durango. So it's called The Night's Dead. So there is a short story regarding what you would do to make your dreams come true. So imagine you're downtrodden with, low, with no prospects and some nefarious entity decided to offer you everything you desire. So what is the cost of it to your soul? Is it worth it in the end? Stephen Dirango discusses that. Mm -hmm. And then there's Simbi, which is a short story I wrote. So Simbi was written uh, based on another story told to me by my maternal grandmother, Damaris Ondijo. Mm -hmm. And the story is based on a place a stone throw away from my mother's village. Mm. You've heard of that lake called Simbi Nyaima? Yes. Yes. So it discusses a village and their perverse aspiration for perfection. And in the end, it brought divine retribution. Guys, this is now what, this was your what book number? That one, since we're counting, Simbi was, Simbi was 17, I think. 17. 17th written, but. Wow. 17th written. 17th written. But what published? What published? I think around uh, eight. Eight. Eight, yeah. Okay. Reluctant Surrender and yeah. other poems. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, now, this is a very special book, actually. So, Reluctant Surrender mm. is, uh, was also published by my publishing company. And uh, I wrote this book together with a gentleman called Dan Ogada. Mm -hmm. So, Dan Ogada also happens to be a psychologist by training and also a poet. So, Dan Ogada was one of my one of the many influences uh, into me becoming an author. Mm -hmm. So Dan lived in Kisumu, and he was a friend to my elder sisters. And uh, usually, and I met him from church because his mother and my mother went to the same church, and so of course we got to start interacting and sharing things. And uh, I always got into trouble because apparently I used to talk too much. So every time we used to leave church. My mom used to put me aside for punishment. Yeah. Yeah. You told, we went to church today and you told Mama Nani something. I'm going to beat you today. <laughs> so it got to a point where I started getting confused because then I was also a young man. I was a child. Mm. So I, 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 now I couldn't really discriminate between what I should say, what I shouldn't say. Mm. So I started holding uh, adults the reservation because I felt like I might just say the wrong thing and get punished <laughs> again. But Dan Ogada, for some yeah. strange reason, allowed me to say as much as I wanted to say. So, and whatever I told him did not end up in the, in the ears of my mother. Yeah. So I know this is an adult who is safe. Mm. I can tell him things. So he allowed me to talk, 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 talk. And in many ways, it's something that I feel that as a society, we should really improve on, right? right? Allowing children to be inquisitive mm. and to say their mind. So Dan Ogada had been looking for a publisher for a long time. Mm. I think he's around, he's in his 40s now, I think. And he reached out to me once he saw some of the launches we had on Facebook. Mm. And I remembered that man who allowed me to have a voice. 
and I felt like I owed him something, mm. right? So let the young boy who you allowed to be himself <laughs> give you a gift in return. Yeah. So we decided to write this book together. So this delves into the issue of addiction. Since we deal with addicts a lot also, right? Mm. And uh, addiction in the sense of love, loss, and other drugs. Yeah. So you've you've done it in form of poems? It's a collection of poems, yes. Okay. I have a lot of questions regarding this book. It's your smallest, I would say, by volume. Mm. Yet it's your most cherished. Ah, okay. I wouldn't say most cherished. I'd <laughs> say it's special. It's special. All these books are special for a different reason. Mm. Yeah, but it is special. I won't deny. Um, um, poetry in itself, in a lugar feature. Poetry has a hidden language. It's 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 art and its way and its mode of communication was to push you to think. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by two psychiatrists writing poems. Is, is it is it that deep? Is it gonna get that deep? Will we even be able to? <laughs> you will, you will. See. Yeah. How do I put it? The idea is this, right? The idea is this. We, in many ways, this is like a form of, a form of uh, a, a, a way to vent and express uh, desires or feelings that are stifled, right? Mm. I want an addict to read this book and realize that they are not alone, that there are other people going through this journey yeah. of sobriety and that the journey can be won. Right, mm. so even in the writing, the form is very relatable, right? So there are no complexities into this, right? Now, for Dan, Dan focused on substance abuse, and I focused on rejection. Like for example, I can give you. Allow me to read quickly. Read a poem. Mm -hmm. It's very, a very brief poem. Yeah, I can read one poem of mine mm. and one poem by Dan very okay. briefly, since I'm very short in All right. Yeah. And please, this is a work of fiction, so it doesn't in no way reflect to me. Yeah, <laughs> yes. this is a work of fiction. An invaluable lesson by Franz Oano. I am capable of affection, but I wouldn't dare to hazard love, for it makes dregs out of men, devouring souls in its den. Anyango taught me a lesson, one I'm not keen to forget, a cautionary tale of passion and the aftermath of its wreck. As I scour through my heart for emotions I once felt, I consigned myself to solitude, filling the void with whiskey and regret. Anyango taught me a lesson, one I'm not keen to forget. For the monster she created, I remain in her debt. So, we decided to focus on two fronts. Dan Ogada focused on someone trying to overcome addiction. I, on the other hand, focused on a man who has been burned by love, mm. trying to find a way to forgive and move on. Right? I can, can I read another poem briefly? Yes. Very briefly. No, I'll seem bitter if I read this poem. Yeah, let me leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> let me look for more appropriate. Yeah. So, basically, yeah. at the end of the poem, at the end of the poem, this young man finds a resolution. Yeah? Right? And so the same Anyango that, that, that he was so embittered with, mm. they have a reunion. And he writes a poem that is a proposal of marriage. And it's called Dia Nyango by the Lake. So Dia Nyango by the Lake, balancing your water pot, looking more sumptuous than cake. The sight of you I have devoured as much as a man's eyes can partake. The divinity of your beauty, full credit, Nyasaya should take. But will pursuing you be my grand mistake? Though often my feelings have declared in the most abundant of ways, from mountain tops to the peaks of pyramids of clay, yet you continue to constantly say that my words are empty and hold no sway. You claim I'm too westernized, a white man's mind. But should the ability to read and write surely be labeled a crime? What I feel for you is pure, genuine, and will transcend time. With me, you can experience the sublime. From the recesses of Seme, I have traveled many a mile. I come bearing gifts to infinity's pile, desperately hoping all this while that my supplication will be met with a generous smile. Yet the odious attentions of that geriatric you keep, that grotesque polygamist, 
whose simplicity makes me weep. His distress is vast, as his lust is deep. The calamity of such a union would be tragic and steep. Illiteracy I will gladly embrace. If your stance, it will placate. For Cicero Caesar and Shakespearean debate could hardly replace a worthwhile mate. Dear Nyango, by the lake, dispel your fears and set a date for a matrimony predated by fate. Mm. I know you said that the first one was uh, was a, was fiction, even this one. Ah. But there is something common about Anyango. You know what, yeah? Yeah. Tell him I'll not answer that question. <laughs> I'm feeling attacked. <laughs> so let me read one for you. We shall not discuss Anyango. All right. And then it's circumstances. You are, you've answered us anyway. Ah. Ah. <laughs> so the next, the last poem I want to read mm. is actually the title. Yeah. Right? Called Reluctant Surrender. And uh, it's by Dan Ogada. And it discusses the push and pull nature, right? And the almost sense of helplessness that we have when in the throes of addiction, right? So Reluctant Surrender by Dan Ogada. Piece by piece, I sold off my life. For the tunnel's end seemed without light. I sold and sold till was left no soul. To sell but the jaded self, rabid by foul. I no longer could incur any more debt. I stood lonely, surrounded by the stench of death. East or west, the entire horizon was jinxed. Black smoke, crude blood, my breath was mixed. The cruel claws of despair, no and no. And all boundaries I surpassed, both in jungle and law. This vicious sword was cast in past, and the unseen forever, slaying body, mind, and spirit together, on account of a deeper inner voice saying, Surrender. At the mercy of this potent nefarious force, I desperately remember a time before I succumbed to this reluctant surrender. Wow. Reluctant surrender. Beautiful poems. If you love them, check him out. And remember this conversation we are holding today at the Nuria Bookstore. And you can see from our backgrounds, they are one of the leading people who have stocked Kenyan authors' books. And, and I want to talk about France's three final books quickly, France. Simon, Simeon's. So this was actually uh, the first book that I published a solo author. Because you've noticed I publish collections. Yeah. And I, we have several authors together. So this was the first solo book that I published a solo author. Mm -hmm. So out of the authors I've worked with, I discussed with George Gardiani to give me a full-length novella, right? Mm. And I sort of conned him into writing this book because I think, I think uh, he had elements of self-doubt and didn't think he could actually get to the word count. Mm. So every time he got to five, when he got to 5,000 words, I told him, just add 2,500 more. And uh, I kept making him add 2,500 more until he got to 20,000. So by the time he got there, I think his confidence had surged and we started working on editing the manuscript. So Simeon's, basically, by George Gardiani, is based on a fictional world, an alternative reality. So let us assume that human beings did not evolve the way they did, right? Mm. And uh, in this society, and I can simplify to the synopsis, mm. in a world where human beings never existed, early mammals evolved into an advanced race of far-growing simians, developing highly advanced technology and a monarchical culture similar to our own. But these advances, however, came at a steep cost to the residents of this earth. A pampered young prince on vacation from school is confronted by the very horrors that his ruling family wrought on the planet kingdom of Gaia. Thus unfolds a tale of class warfare, splintering friendships in the face of duty and power and legacy, all while the hierarchical society wrestles with its conceived notions of moral responsibility, freedom, and equality. So imagine a world in which we are as hairy as apes. Imagine a world where... Uh, what's the, I'm looking for the word. Where... Our skin is not as it as it is right now. Mm. And this world creates a distinction between the higher classes and the lower classes. So the idea is the lower classes cannot afford to shave their body hair. So it's like a way of branding them. Mm. Right? So ideally when you walk somewhere, when you walk by in this world, when you walk by someone who has full blown hair everywhere, you know that he's poor or from a certain social strata. Mm. And when someone has skin like yours and mine, ideally, we're from the wealthy 1%. So in, a, in how many ways does society brand itself and creates systems of opposition, of me against you, right? You can call yourself a communist. You can call yourself a capitalist. You can call yourself uh, uh, a, toxic, uh, a toxic chauvinist. You can mm -hmm. call yourself a feminist, right? 
in how many ways do we brand each other right yeah. that's what this book delves into looking at it um what was his reaction when he realized that oh we were writing a book what was his reaction yes so uh first of all he went to a lance also <laughs> uh, has had put that in there yeah <laughs> uh, so you see for him mm-hmm. he is an author that has been easy to work with because he's also as passionate about this as me and he's also intent on leaving his mark in the world and the idea is this right the discussions of inequality which we will delve into more mm. in one of my other books right is it wrong for me to be pro a system that maintains my place in society is it wrong for me to want my children to be beneficiaries of such a system right mm. at the same time someone who is disenfranchised right is it wrong for them to want to upend the system totally so this prince comes to a realization that he was born in privilege but his family might be uh exacting so much harm on this make believe world so he has a decision does he maintain the status quo and side with his family mm-hmm. or does he pick up the sword of justice which is something in many ways uh as a society we have conflicts with right do we speak up against a system that favors us yeah yeah for the improvement of society as a whole or do we maintain status quo and just turn a blind eye mm-hmm. so those are the motivations of this book you've spoken of a prince heart of a prince heart of a prince tell us about heart of a prince so heart of a prince is also a, a, bo- a book a novella or rather novel that was inspired by discussions with my mother my mother has been also very instrumental in my in uh, in uh, my literary journey mm-hmm. as well as my father so this is a story that came out of a conflict in how i was raised so like i said earlier i was raised by a devout christian woman and the tenets of equality quality fairness right and wrong empathy were things that were ingrained in me but at the same time I was raised by a very practical man who understood that the world is not fair and that you have to arm yourself with tools mm-hmm. to rise in an unfair world so i got access to books such as the art of war 48 laws of power right and these are books that my dad made us read and read and reread so there's a bit of conflict between the two right on one hand i'm being told to turn the other cheek based on christian tenets on the other hand i'm being taught how to grasp for power and rise in an unfair world so the story of moses came up and i asked my mom what would make a prince accept to be a slave why would you forgo all the trappings of power to accept servitude and hardship it made no sense to me why wouldn't moses since he already he, the world identified him as an egyptian prince why not maintain it and ride that wave to the end right so the idea was what would make someone like me accept such a hazardous path forgo everything accept servitude slavery the lack of status for the search of identity and that was a book that i decided I'd want to read so I wrote it yes tell us about the cover what what was the, the motivation motivation and the thoughts so the heart of a prince mm. basically is is not only about Moses transition from from a prince to a freedom an icon of freedom it is also the journey of his brother his uh his brother Ramses the mm. second so it's believed that if you check the history books the Israelites were slaves in Egypt during the time of Ramses II right however if you actually check the Egyptian hieroglyphics they have no records of the Israelites being slaves they mention them living in Egypt in passing so mostly this is biblical reference so Ramses II was the son of Seti I who was the crown prince of Egypt who was destined to become pharaoh right mm-hmm. so he grew up with Moses as a brother and they went through the all the transitions that a prince requires to become a king you have to go through military tutelage you have to be taught governance and more importantly you have to go to war because you have to lead your troops from mm. the front mm. right so moses transitions through all these things with the brother ramses but at the same time ramses path is more defined he knows that uh becoming god's personification on earth son of ra that's what uh what's what uh, pharaohs call themselves the mm. son of ra the mm. sun god so he knew i'm going to become the son of ra so everything for him was so definite the transition was so clear but for moses on the other hand there was a bit of a gap 
So am I going to be Ramsey's sidekick my entire life? Is there more of a purpose to my life apart from uh, heeding and doing what Ramsey needs to be done? So the heart of the prince is a transition of what it takes for a boy to become a man mm. and what it takes for a man to become a king. So in the end, to develop the heart of a prince is to learn to hate. So ideally, what I learned and what conclusion I came to in developing the heart of a prince is to learn to channel hate. They, so the problem with hate is it clouds your mind, disorients your focus, and makes you make emotional decisions. If you can master hate to the extent that you can work with your worst enemy as long as you need them, turn on him in a dime when you need to do it, and do him for 10 years as long as he's useful, that is the heart of a prince. To be able to put your emotions aside, yeah, for the expediency of the moment, to bide your time, yeah, and to be ruled by logic, mm -hmm. that is the heart of a prince. And wow. I repeat, being able to channel hate. And these two characters, Ramses II and Moses. So Moses' name in this book is actually not Moses. He has an Egyptian name. His mm -hmm. name is Thutmose II, right? Mm -hmm. So Thutmose II and Ramses are on a certain path, but they, they, their paths diverge in the year 1274 in a battle called the Battle of Kadesh. So it's actually historically written. There's a battle called the Battle of Kadesh. You can check it up in the history books. Mm. So of course, I used my artistic license to recreate that battle. So at the end of that battle, one man is ready to become a pharaoh. The other man is now chosen by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. So in, in, in a sense or two, both of them are acquiring the heart of a prince. Yeah, But the diverging point is what matters. Mm. I won't delve more into wow. it because I'll destroy the story for you. <laughs> and then recently, last week, yes, yes, yes. you launched the vision of Chrysalis. Tell us about the vision. So, the idea of this story is this, basically. It is set in the year 2150, which is around the 22nd century, right? And by the time this story is being told, there is a proliferation in artificial intelligence and cybernetics and robotics. So it gets to a point where robots can do almost anything that we do, right? So society is split into two groups. The wealthy 1% called the plutocrats and the 99% of, of the masses called the precariates. Now the plutocrats are the people who control the capital in society. And so they decide to mechanize everything. So almost overnight, white collar jobs, blue collar jobs are taken by machines. So you can imagine it reaches a point where even I as a doctor, I'm operating with a machine, mm. right? Then there's no use for accountants. There's no use for, law, for lawyers. There are no use for teachers. AI can do everything. And the robots are doing everything. And it gets to a point that it's so dire that the trade unions cannot negotiate because you cannot negotiate by having a notice of a strike, true? But the machines live longer than you. The machines don't age. The machines don't have emotions. The machines can work tirelessly. The machines don't take breaks. The machines don't go on maternity leave. Mm -hmm. They are ruthlessly efficient and they are good for business. So the trade unions cannot negotiate because even if you go on a strike, the machines will continue. But half of society almost overnight has been rendered jobless. Mm. So, of course, society is held in turmoil. And, of course, it's, it's, this book is set in Kenya. So, of course, the riots begin. The civil unrest continues. Right? Mm. And it gets to a point where an all-out war begins called the conquest of bread. Yeah. So, this conquest of bread is led by a, 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 a lawyer lady from Bugoma County. So, a revolution called the conquest of, of bread led by a lady called October Nafula. So she leaves the 99% against the 1% of society. And I repeat, the 99% are a group of people called the precariates. And the 1% are called the plutocrats, mm. the wealthy few. Mm. So she leaves them in a revolution to create equality between man and machines, right? And the idea is to integrate society, to have 50% of machines in the workforce mm. and 50% of human beings, right? So at the end of the conquest of bread, the only way to adopt a system of equality is to adopt chrysalis. Mm. So what is chrysalis? So chrysalis is a system that attempts to create equality in the Kenyan society in a way that has never been done before. So what it does is, it is evident that the rich will become richer, the poor continue becoming poorer, and there are lots of people who are leaving behind on this journey towards 
economic freedom. So what Carisalis does is to destabilize the system to give everyone a fair chance of enjoying wealth, poverty, and relative affluence. Mm. So what Carisalis does is when a citizen gets to the age of 11, and, uh, a microchip is placed at the base of their skull. Mm. And then from there, nanotechnology is used. You've heard of nanotechnology? Yes. So nanites are introduced into their system and it lodges into the brain. Mm. And the nanites release a compound called LRED. So what this compound does is it, it begins to prevent access to certain memories. So what, what happens when you get to 11 and you get the nanites in your system and the microchip, you start to transition between five stages of of five stages every five years. So there's the there's the gold cycle where you experience extreme wealth. Then the next five years you're taken to the what? The the silver cycle, which is middle class. Then the next five years you're taken to the to the iron cycle, which is extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. But before you transition into each cycle, your memories of the previous cycle are either erased mm -hmm. or you're prevented from accessing them. Because the idea is this. Imagine if I uh, I live in a penthouse in Rwanda and Almost overnight, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm living on the side of the road in a slum. Mm. Yeah, the, ne the neurosis would render you insane, don't mm. you think? Mm. The depression, anxiety, and suicidality. True. Mm. So the idea of this, of erasing your memories, is to make a clean transition into each stage. Mm. True. So some people believe that the idea of taking away people's memories is a kai and horrendous. Mm. But at the same point in time. If we allow you to have these memories, will you honestly transition comfortably? No. But what is the only way to make sure that the son of a prince and the son of a pauper both get to enjoy wealth and destitution? Chrysalis seems to be the only method. Mm. So like I said, you transition through all the stages every five years. Extreme wealth, extreme poverty, and extreme wealth, middle class, affluence, and extreme poverty. And it happens in a cycle. And your memory is erased in every cycle mm. until you get to the age of 65. Once you get to the age of 65, all your, the, the nanobytes are deactivated and all your memories come back. But this is the, kick, the kicker. Mm. The moment your memories come back, you're separated from the rest of society. So once you get to 65, you're put into a secluded city called Vito City. So you're separated from the rest of the people who are still going through the cycles of Chrysalis. Now, in the backdrop of this story, this is a society where your microchip controls everything, yeah, in, even in terms of financial transactions. So you cannot game the system by removing the microchip because you'll die. Mm. You cannot transact anything without the microchip since it's a cashless society. Mm. So you have to have it on you. And on top of that, the microchip logs all the cycles of the Chrysalis evolutions that you've gone through. So you cannot game the system. True? Mm. Ideally. However, what if there is one man who has found a way to keep all his memories? It would be like someone having eyes in a society of blind people. Mm. Wouldn't you agree that is power? It is. It is power. So this society, also in a strange way, is controlled by AI because there has to be a program that controls how your memories are, are how your memories are filtered. Yeah. So there is a program called Jezebel that calibrates how much of this compound called LRED that is released into your brain mm. that has that decides how much of your memories you'll retain and how much will be erased. Mm. Because the idea is if we if too much of the compound is released, you'll have total amnesia. You won't even remember your friends and family. If not enough is, is erased, mm. you'll have memories of your previous cycle, which will cause anxiety and depression and neurosis. So, in the backdrop of all this, political system is also controlled by AI. Mm. Because we've realized in Africa, we have a problem with transition of political leaders, right? Someone might be good for a country, but the moment he dies, he's taken over, it's, uh, the leadership, or the reins are taken over by someone who is incompetent, and we start regressing. Mm. So what AI does, this AI, in uh, the lower positions of power are allowed to vote. But when it comes to the leader of the country, and in this fictional world, the yeah. leader is called a visor not a president, it's called a visor. Mm. And the AI chooses three families randomly from all walks of life. Mm. So, for example, me, you, and the cameraman. So you go in terms of five years. So after you do your five years, automatically it comes to me, 
and then automatically it goes to him. So it creates checks and balances, right? And mm-hmm. prevents a system of dictatorship. True? So in the backdrop of this story, the current visor is called Hector Bakari, and he's on his deathbed, and he's dying. The next visor is, is called Hassan Hassan. So he's been elevated to the visorship prematurely. Mm. And at the same time, Hector's wife, October Nafula II, is being executed for treason. His son, Victor Bakari, has been called to, sp- to say goodbye to his parents, right? And at the same time, there's another third gentleman, called Jock Joey. He is the third person in line to become the visor. So Hector knows that his, his father has been poisoned and he's going to witness his mother's execution a few hours later. Mm. Hassan Nasir is prematurely becoming the next visor, right? Mm. And Hector believes in some way that he's, in a way he's responsible for his father's death mm. and mother's death. Ojok Joey, who is third in line to become the next visor, also wants to become visor prematurely. Mm. So he wants to remove Hassan's ascendancy. Mm. So this is a story of three men who are all angling for power. Mm. So <coughs> Hector wants revenge for his parents, and probably to become the next visor in some way. Hassan wants to maintain his foothold on power, and Ojok Joey wants to supplant Hassan. Mm. So friendships are formed, enemies unite, alliance is broken in the visions of Chrysalis. Wow. Yes. You've set the story for 2051. Not 2051, 2150. 2150. Between 2150 and 2200. It's in the 22nd century. In the 22nd century. Yes. I relate to bits and pieces of this thing that is already happening today <clears throat> when you're looking at uh, human beings trying to become machines. Mm. You know, at first, when uh, people are transitioning and trying to understand AI, machine was being made to think and behave like a human. But we are journeying to a space where we are pushing the human mm. to behave and act like a machine. You're saying something. So basically, yeah, if you can see the cover, yeah, yeah. The, the whole element of this story is, well, as human beings, since we depend on AI so much, yeah. it gets to a point where uh, AI will literally obliterate us, or in a sense, phase us out. Because imagine a scenario where you have an artificial intelligence that is smarter than us, but has no morality, has no checks and balances, we cannot create oversight over them. Mm. Imagine a scenario of having artificial intelligence politicians. Yeah. Imagine a world with AI pastors. Imagine a world with AI serial killers. Imagine having a world with AI terrorists. And like I repeat, mm. they are smarter than us. They are stronger than us. They don't age. And imagine if they have no morality. Wouldn't we be at their mercy? Yeah, right. And those are, those, are, those are the kind of questions I need us to ask ourselves. Deep and disconcerting questions about yeah. how much power we are ceding away artificial intelligence yeah uh, elon musk's company has has, has launched Neuralink. yes mm. and i think they tested it sometime mm. last week they're saying it's ready to go okay how 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 do you look at that world where and I, and i also i also alongside that i also had there is a guy there is a is it in the uk who also he wants to sit comfortably but control the devices in the house. He can point on the TV and it it, 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 it goes on and off. Mm. And, and A smart house, yeah? Yes. And all these transitions and translates to data. Mm. The imaginary world you've created mm. is not so far away if you think about it critically. Mm. That person the things that are controlled in that person's mind mm. for those five years mm. is just data. It is. Today we are at a place where everybody's competing for data. And cookies are all over the place. Everybody's trying to figure out what are you doing, what are you looking for, what are you thinking, what are you saying, who are you talking to, who are you looking for. Right now as we speak here, if somebody in this space has a device that has a Google uh, app, it's listening to all these things and it's likely to play ads and all these other things. It's used, eventually it's used for for so, business. Surveillance capitalism. Surveillance and that. Mm. Come back to Kenya. How far are we from really tackling it? 
as a people later so basically put yeah one of the reasons why this society has decided to cede some control to ai is because unlike unlike human beings ideally you cannot bribe an ai with money it has no need for money you cannot bribe an ai with power until this until this scenario of course yeah mm-hmm. so ai are beyond the inducements of human beings and that is why ideally we should be able to trust them to control the political system in this fictional world mm. there is no way you can allow the wealthy 1% right not meddle in the affairs of the state of a country to decide the political dynasties that are created mm-hmm. time and again they will always meddle right so ai is a way of creating oversight mm. but now the only problem is right what if ai starts developing a mind of its own what if ai like a child decides to transcend its parents yeah life is a journey of transcendence yeah we are dependent on our parents they teach us morality right and wrong so that we can be independent on our own mm. it gets to a point where we are stronger than them and we yes. even take care of them yes but what happens to a scenario where you have a child that decides to grow and nurture itself without your input isn't that scary it is what if the ai now decides they no longer need us in fact if anything we're a waste of resources let's create a new race of robots and make human beings our slaves you know when you look when you used to look at those alien movies it it used to look like something like that somebody was just doing some test in a lab somewhere they were trying to create something somewhere in a lab and 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 all of a sudden this thing is more clever it's more energetic it's it has things you didn't foresee are we headed there with the ai and to be honest with you i think we are i think we are already there the only difference is uh can can we cannot run away from progress because we'll be dumb to live in the past however can we find a way to merge progress at the same time not lose ourselves in the process because in visions of chrysalis is an interview by an artificial intelligence that has lived for around to 50 years and it discusses what it means to be human you can imagine a robot discussing what it means to be human right so this is an ai that learns to mimic human emotion right which essentially is what neuralink is trying to do right mm-hmm. so what does it mean to be human does it is it merely in a physical sense of having a beating heart and flesh and blood or is it how you perceive things and emotion yeah is it a a combination of having a, a spiritual core at the same time having a physical body if i transfer my consciousness into a, a steel robot am i still human if i do not have blood coursing through my veins am i less human so what in a sense does it mean to be human yeah that's another question that this and, book and, and, delves into exactly and 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 if today you because they they are lost mm. today we have france mm. france commits a crime is arrested and jailed mm. if if france can now transition into this metallic gadget that thinks behaves and does everything france would have done mm. could it still be taken through a criminal justice system as france would have been now usually there's something called mens rea the intention to commit a crime mm. and it's something we also have to consider as psychiatrists if i'm to evaluate someone who has committed a crime i have to make sure that he was not in the right state of mind when he did it was he in the throes of an acute psychotic break right did it, was it an issue of temporary insanity were they in the right frame of mind when they committed the crime was it unpremeditated right yeah. so ideally if that consciousness that has been transferred to that robotic feature is in a right frame of mind frame of mind and has not been corrupted then i think you can prosecute them if there was a bug or a virus in it yeah. that would say one thing that would be a different thing yeah friends yes sir we can have a conversation for the whole day and especially with your profession and your writing i like i i have i've loved your writing four of your books are in the united states library of congress tell us about that uh so as well it's an honor yeah yeah and uh, it, uh it's it's a validation of all the hard work that i've been doing and it makes me feel very appreciated and gives me uh the motivation to continue pushing further how how did it get there so basically uh uh you dis- you write 
certain themes of interest to you and that you think of interest to the world and your country at large that will provide value. You stock your books at the bookshop. Uh, one of the representatives passes by and uh, they may purchase the book and decide if it's of value to them. If it is, you're, you're notified and they make a requisition for around 20 copies that are ferried there. Yes. Yeah, for those who don't know, United States Library of Congress is the largest library in the world. It has, I would say, anything possible that could inform a decision-making process. And Franz, the gentleman with us today, has four, not one, not two, not three, but four of his publications stocked at the United States uh, um, Library of Congress. You are a doctor. You are an author. You also paint. You are an You've left publisher. You are a publisher. I was coming to the publisher because I want to, you've spoken a lot about mm. when you started publishing. Okay. And you now incorporated other people. Okay. Tell me about your art side briefly. So basically, the art, it's a, it's a form of art called uh, uh, visual art, yeah? So the idea is to create to create virtual 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 uh, what do you call them virtual museums so instead of having to go all the way somewhere waste uber fare uh, uh mingle with people i want to avoid if i can simply enjoy the experience of an exhibition yeah. from from the confines of my house so the idea is to create a virtual 3d environment where you can enjoy an exhibition from the comfort of your home most doctors say being a doctor is a calling. It's their purpose. But you, despite being a doctor, a writer, you say art is your purpose. Why is it so? There are different forms of art. And even, even in medicine, I think I'm creating my own form of art. Yeah, By changing people's perspective, uh, by, by, by making people believe they can be in control of the future, taking narratives, taking control of the current narrative of their lives, yeah, to paint the kind of future that they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I believe sometimes our lives are like a plain canvas. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, we are the painters, so you decide what you will produce. And as a mental health professional, if I can help you paint a beautiful picture, and not one of despair, one of hope, and something to look forward to, don't you think I'm an artist in that sense? You yeah. are. Yes. Yeah. So where can we find these books? These books are available at Nuria Bookstore. All of them. All of them. All right. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Franz. Thank you for your time and thank you for creating time to be here and share with us your knowledge. Okay. And I am a hundred percent sure that I'm not done with you yet. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that marks the end of this show. And what is it that you've heard from Franz that intrigues you, that fascinates you? Um, all these books are available at Nuria Bookstore where we've held this conversation today and you can see it from the shelves. Check them out. They also have a, the online platform, nuriakenya.com, where you can check out some of those books. Look at the synopsis. They have a physical shop at the 11th floor of the Baza Plaza. Come, see what you can be able to pick. But above everything else, I hope this conversation with uh, Franz has pushed you to a certain thought or has opened us up to something that maybe you never looked at it like that. But Franz will be here. He's going to be among our network. So we will have conversations with him. And I hope if you have questions, if you have things that you feel like we've not spoken about extensively, that maybe you'd want him to expound, he will be happy to do that. So thank you so much for also watching. Thank you so much for joining with us through this episode. I've been your host, Mulure Mike. And this, of course, is brought to you courtesy of uh, in, in association with the Nuria Bookstore and the Kenya National Library Service, which is the national library service of this republic. So see you again on the next one. Thank you so much. And I hope that you've picked something for your next read. <laughs>